So we're going to start with the dichotomous example, and um, I assume you have the software already installed, um, and I'm just going to start RStudio. Right, and then I'm going to load the IFA tools package, and then I'm going to start model builder. And it, it does pop up in this uh, RStudio's browser window here, but um, I'm going to click this open in a browser button because it looks a little bit better. And um, the, uh, the RStudio browser is missing some functionality. So we're going to use it. This is, uh, you could use Firefox, but this is, or, or Safari, any browser you like. This, is, this happens to be Chrome. Okay, great. So it looks like it's time to load um, the dichotomous data. Yes, let's try that. So choose your file. Yep. And the example we've got here is g341-19.csv. And you can see that the data is, has been uploaded. So uh, however, <coughs> um, something went wrong. Mm -hmm. So if we look here, there is an error message, and it's complaining about something. So um, in this case, the important part of the error is that, that something about row names. And if you look at the data, you'll see that um, there probably aren't row names. Row names would be like if you had the, the names of each examinee on each row. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we don't have that, so we have to turn the row names off, and when we do that, it immediately it updates here. So we also have um, still another problem, because if you look at um, the first six lines, it shows that there's a header, but it's actually not a header. Hmm. Right. So the this um, this first line is being interpreted as uh, the header. So let, let's just turn that off. And now now we get a uh, hmm, v1. But aren't there there's uh, there are at least ten columns here. So so let's try a different separator. Maybe white space work. Okay. That makes us happy. We now have 12 columns, one for each of the variables uh, that we have in the responses, and we have um, rows designated by a number, which indicates a person. Um, one, <coughs> one thing that's not ideal about this example is the, uh, the columns don't have um, very good names. It's just V1 through 12. Normally, you'd want uh, a name that reminds you of what the item was right. with the, the, uh, that they either got right or wrong. Um, so let's see. Here's another way of looking at the um, the data. There's there's two outcomes. So all the items are either right or wrong. Got right or wrong responses, mm -hmm. and uh, there's no data missing. So that's a nice uh, way to summarize the data and see if everything got read properly by clicking that item summary tab. Yeah. Terrific. All right, so let's go over to the outcomes section of the model builder. Um, let's see. There's only one outcome set. The outcome set is um, all the different kind of uh, responses that items have. So um, since all our items are dichotomous, there's only one kind of uh, one kind of outcomes for all the items. If we if we you can look at the um, each item separately here too, and you, this would uh, update if it was different. But they're all the same. They all all of them have uh, two different outcomes. It's either zero or one. Mm -hmm. 
um, now that, that's kind of uh, zero and one is um, that's kind of hard to remember what it means. So we uh, we recommend that you rename them to names like correct and incorrect. So now we have zero indicating that the response is incorrect and one being correct. Actually, wait. Oh, I see. Something went wrong here. Um, so for item V2, uh, all right, so let's see. Now we have a complication. If we look at, um, hmm, uh, okay, so when I, uh, what happened was I, I had demonstrated uh, what happens when you select. Uh, an item instead of an outcome set and then uh, then I made some mappings and so now we have uh, two different outcome sets one one for uh, uh, v2 outcome one let's say so one one outcome set for v2 and then the other outcome set uh, I know it's uh, Let's see. This is this v two the item, mm -hmm. and then uh, v one represents all the other other items, and they they have this uh, this other coding. So um, this is a bit confusing. Let's just uh, start over. So let's get rid of these. So that's a nice feature too. Is that if you make a, a decision that isn't something that that you prefer, you could just go to the bottom and hit discard. Great. Alright, so let's try this again. So now I have outcome, outcome set V1 selected, and uh, I'm going to rename 0 to incorrect, and 1 to, uh, no, no, 1 to uh, correct. <coughs> Alright, so now, now we have recoded them, and we can check that the 0 corresponds to incorrect, and 1 corresponds to correct over here. <coughs> now let's go to the reorder tab. Right, and um, we're gonna put incorrect first and correct second. That's just kind of a, um, uh, it's kind of arbitrary, but, but that's generally how uh, people order their responses. So it's logical. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So none of our items are reversed, uh, but if one of them was reverse scored, then we could uh, we could indicate that here, and then that would switch the meaning of incorrect and and correct. Uh, this is more useful when there's when the, the items are have more than two outcomes when they're not dichotomous. All right, so now I'm going to go to the model section of the model builder. Great. So here you can um, select uh, the number of factors that you would like to have extracted. So we have it, the little slider is on one and now it's going over to two. Um, so that goes, how many factors does it go all, to, all the way up to five, which is usually more than one would want anyway. So, uh, and as, if you notice as Joshua uh, slid the slider to the right, uh, names came up for the five factors. And as you can also see, the names that are default uh, are, are just uh, amusing and not logical, so you're going to want to change those as soon as you make a determination of how many factors you've got uh, desired in your factor analysis. So we're going to call factor one trait. Yeah. That, that's all that you do on this tab. Um, and then on the next tab, you could reorder your items. Uh, if you had logical groupings of items, this could be useful. So the next tab is parameters, and as you can see here, um, there are start values for 
um, that first factor for all 12 of the variables um, and the um, the B, the item threshold for each of the items is, is on that second uh, highlighted line. Um, in the next section, the, um, that table indicates whether or not the parameter estimate is free or fixed. And so every one of these says true, so all of them are being estimated. And in the next section, uh, you can have labels uh, in there, and that's um, blank right now. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, we the last table is a Bayesian prior mode, um, and that is something that can be um, added in also. Yep. We're gonna we're gonna set those up in a minute. Okay. Um, so let's see. I think we're, what we're gonna do is take the first six items and narrow our focus to those, and then switch the model to the uh, 4PL dichotomous response model. Uh, by default, the model is the graded response model. And another option for uh, if you have more than two outcomes, you could use the, the, uh, the nominal response model. Those are the three options available right now. So here we have um, more lines in the tables. So we have um, the uh, loading at the top under trait, and then the item location or threshold, um, which we denote as B. And then G is the uh, lower asymptote parameter. And then U stands for the upper asymptote uh, parameter. Right. And then finally, uh, the tables as, as before, um, the, uh, is free. Those are all free, freely estimated parameters. And the other two tables were as before. They just have extra lines. All right. So, um, OK, so let's, uh, let's pick one of the parameters to work on. Um, let's start with the U parameter, the upper asymptote. And we'll fix it to uh, infinity, which is um, this. These are in logit units, so uh, both of these, the guessing, the both of these asymptote parameters are in probability units. But uh, the way we're looking at them in the model builder is they're in lo the logit of the probability unit. So um, infinity actually corresponds to a probability of one. Uh, which, which makes this model work uh, equivalently to the three PL model. Uh, basically, it means uh, it's it's like the. Um, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. <coughs> so and then, uh, then we'll sw go to the, the the lower asymptote, the guessing. Uh, parameter and so we're gonna set that to um, one quarter um, and usually what you do is if you have a dichotomous item with four choices then um, then you would use one quarter because you uh, uh, examinees have a 25% perc chance of guessing it correctly um, Right, regardless of trait level, and it, it never goes below 25% because one could conceivably guess and get the answer correct. So. Um, yeah, so if you had more, uh, more choices in the item, then y you, would, you would use like a, you know, 1 over 7 or whatever it is, however many choices you had. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, right, and so when you set these uh, Bayesian priors, then you also get labels automatically, so that, so they appeared here. Right, so now, now let's, um, 
let's work on the other parameters. So go over to 7 through 12. Yeah. And what we're going to do here is we're going to put an inequality constraint on the slope. So all these slopes are still freely estimated, but they're constrained to be equal. So th these are just starting values, but even the starting values are constrained equal. So I think that's all we need to do to, um, uh, let's see, if you wanted to include exclude any items, you could do that here. And um, then we have uh, another summary of um, number of items reversed or excluded, and outcomes and model. Um, let's see, I think we're ready to save the settings. So um, all these, uh, all this stuff that we've just uh, set up here can be saved just in case you wanted to revise it later. So I'm going to uh, download and it gives a, a uh, uh, this, the same name as the data file with a dash config on it. And we can test this by opening a new tab with the same URL. So we still have our old tab here and we have another new tab that which is just empty and I'm going to load the same data. And set up, set it up. And then I'm going to go to the settings section. And I'm going to try to load the settings from that file we just saved. Am I going too fast? No, I think that's good. Alright, so, so now we have the recoding and th the outcomes are ordered in the right order. The model. And hopefully all the parameters are set up properly. Yep, looks good. Um, so now both tabs are actually set up exactly the same way and we can just get rid of one of them. So now we, we've uh, checked that our settings were saved uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. And um, now let's run uh, run the analysis. So it, it's this, it generates a, a bunch of R markdown code and we're going to try running it. Great. Let's download it. And now I'm going to switch back to RStudio. Um, let's see, to use RStudio, I do need to uh, stop the model builder here. So these screens all went gray. Um, this may be something that's particular to Linux, I'm, I'm not sure. Or you could, you, you could just start another copy of our uh, studio if you wanted to leave them both going. All right, so here's the file that was generated. And um, then we click this button, knit HTML. Ah, and we get an error right away. Okay, so, um, so what happened was it doesn't know where to load the data file from. And we need to we need to give it the, the full path here, so I'm just gonna punch that in. All right, and let's try again. Now we scrolled by pretty fast, but um, this red. Oh wait, let's hold on. Let's, let's look at this red stuff for a minute. So this this shows the uh, the progress of the. Uh, the model optimization, and um, let's see that looks like the right number down here. 
So again, I'm going to open this in the browser instead of using RStudio. And we can look at the output. So it shows you all the source code. Should we go over? That would probably be good, uh, at least generally. Um, I think you should do this part because I'll go into more detail than you want. Okay, well, <coughs> tell me what, what part to talk about. Um, I would just s say we've got the various sections that indicate um, factors and their number and just kind of, I would do it very quickly. Okay. Things like that. Um, it summarizes if we had any missing data how we coded the labels, um, starting values, just just sort of making a list, but it's just taking them through it. But I would that's about as specific as I would do. Um, let's see, so the the item parameter matrix is set up here. see we have some of them are fixed and then we set up some labels um, and this this is the uh, the item model altogether and then the for the Bayesian priors we need to build a whole new model for that um, it's not quite as straightforward as in other uh, other software where you just click on a checkbox or something but you actually need to set up the um, the gradient and Hess in the Hessian for these uh, for the for the Bayesian prior um, it's, it's done in this block so but fortunately the code is generated for you so you don't have to struggle with it too much and then we uh, build an MX model for the Bayesian priors here um, then we we have a container model that has the item model and the Bayesian Bayesian priors, and we we uh, we sum them together. Or we sum their log likelihoods. So, <coughs> and then let's see. This is the. Uh, We use a expectation maximization algorithm for uh, optimizing the item parameters. Uh, there's uh, another algorithm which uses uh, a more probabilistic Monte Carlo approach, and that's not implemented yet. Although um, it'd be very useful to have because it's better at at, uh, at higher dimensional models. So this this EM. Uh, this EM algorithm mm, works pretty well up to four or five dimensions, but then, um, then that's uh, it, it becomes too slow. Uh, so if we um, eventually we'll add the other the other algorithm which can handle higher dimensional models. Uh, so after we fit the item parameters, then we. Uh, uh, we get the information matrix using uh, a algorithm due to Oaks, uh, which is seems to be very accurate. And then we compute the Hessian quality and the standard errors here. And let's see. Um, so we let's see what what we would talk be about next. what um, so this next part looks like it's um, talking about the fit and putting it into a, an object. Um, I'm not sure what group is Joshua. Right. So okay. So there's um, everything. Up here is m mostly dealing with OpenMX, 
uh, OpenMX is um, all these matrices and so forth are are uh, handled by OpenMX. And now this uh, as IFA group this translates the OpenMX uh, the fit model that was uh, produced by OpenMX into uh, a different kind of format which is um, tailored for the the RPF package which mm -hmm. which has all these uh, diagnostics that are specific to uh, item factor analysis or item response theory and um, and OpenMX is more of like a generic kind of modeling and optimization tool whereas the uh, RPF library is more specific to uh, modern, te modern test theory it has a bunch of stuff that are that is uh, applicable for these kind of models so that that's that's where most of these plots are coming from is from the the uh, RPF package so the first plot here is looking at the uh, sum scores comparing the um, let's see sum score EAP so uh, predicted sum scores versus observed sum scores for the for all the items so you can get um, at most 12 items correct and that's why the x-axis goes from 0 to 12 and you can see how more people are getting uh, higher values right than lower values right in terms of a sum score and and you can also see that the observed and the expected uh, curves are really, really close together. Um, very, very little deviation in them. Yeah, there's there's a little gap here, but it's probably not too bad. Um, the uh, there is a you you could uh, compute like a, a chi squared statistic to to um, look at the difference between these, but. Um, the, that's kind of a new a new test, and uh, the meaning of the of that comparison is not really nailed down yet. So, mm -hmm. so I haven't I haven't included that here. Uh, now, one of the important assumptions in uh, this kind of analysis is that items are conditionally independent. Um, so, fortunately, there's there's a way to, to to kind of look at the residuals and check whether that assumption is is holding up or not. And um, one of the best performing ways to do that is is using the method in detail in this paper, Chen and Thyssen, uh, 1997. And um, this it looks at item pairs here, and all these numbers are uh, are log p values. So um, the larger they are, the more significant it is. Uh, or that we're the uh, the null hypothesis hypothesis is that the items are conditionally independent. So if it's rejected, then it means we have a problem. Um, so the uh, the first set of items look pretty good. Uh, uh, the uh, if we, if we go back here, if, t if we take the, um, oh, stop the rate. So the log, log p values, uh, so the log of, of 0.01 is, is about uh, 4.6. So magnitudes larger than 4.6 would be significant at, at that alpha level. Um, so that there's uh, there's a a lot of uh, pairs of items where the we have a very s the hypothesis is rejected by quite a large margin. Yeah, most most of the items beyond uh, variable six are show some issues. Yeah. Maybe not so much within themselves, mm -hmm. right? So eleven and uh, eleven and t or ten and 
10 and 12 don't look so bad, but mm -hmm. between uh, the first six and the last six look particularly bad. Right. Um, so w what could that be due to? Measuring redundancy, maybe they're measuring the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, it could also be the model is... It's a bad model here. It's a bad model, yeah. yeah. So we should definitely try some different kinds of modeling approaches. Um, you know, one, one thing I did is I constrained all the slopes equal for these these items and, and that could that could have thrown things out of whack because these were uh, all these slopes were freely estimated. Is anything else? I think that's good. Yeah, okay. That's good. Right, so the uh, this table um, looks at item-wise um, how well do other items predict uh, predict outcomes on this item of interest here. So when we look at item 10, what we're looking at is uh, if we ignore item 10 and suppose we use all the other items uh, so nine, nine, uh, 1 to 9 and, and 11, 12, then can we predict what examinees will, s will score, whether they'll be correct or incorrect on, on item 10? So that, that's what, and these p-values are also log p-values, they're in the same units. Um, so this is kind of like a way of looking at, at item-wise misfit. Mm -hmm. good. Um, this is an item response map, so uh, what's shown here is basically the, the average trait score of examinees who picked this, this outcome or this outcome of each of the outcomes. So zero is one and one is two in this particular plot. Oh, right. The way it's labeled. So, um, let's take an example for variable one at the top. Um, uh, the score, the latent trait score of negative 0.5 uh, is associated with that incorrect answer. And uh, and the, and the correct answer of 2 is something that's closer to, what, about 0.4. So it's common, it's more common to think about this dichotomously scored item to maybe only see the correct uh, response uh, shown in a map, but this is showing both the incorrect and the, and the correct um, responses um, according to a uh, trait score. So. Hmm. Okay. Right. Um, and then these plots are essentially um, coming from from uh, the the details of th these tables. So each each of these rows we can turn into a plot, and that's what these plots are. So they show you the. Uh, expected and observed uh, some scores for for each item and so what's nice here is you can see the uh, if you just look at the blue curves uh, those are for the correct responses expected on the left and observed on the right and then of course the incorrect responses are the you know the inverse of those so these are really lovely plots to see to in order to see what's happened, what you expect for the responses and what's actually happened. Um, and at least on this plot, we can really see the lower asymptote. Um, it, you know, it, it uh, bottoms out here at, at uh, 25%. So I can't see it so much in the other ones.
on some of them. Alright. So this next section shows um, the information that is obtained for each item. So this is another extremely useful plot in order to see how useful the item is for measuring trait level. So as you can see, there are 12 curves, one for each item. Um, some of them look very similar to each other, but let's look at the one that is being highlighted there that has a very high peak. I believe that is V1. My, is my color correct? It could be. <laughs> um, and so that, um, the peak of that is a little higher than the other items, and it's also um, more uh, leptocortotic if you're looking at, you know, in terms of distance or shape of the curve. Some of the other ones are flatter and lower, and this one's more peaked and higher. So this item has uh, more information in general, but over a limited range relative to some of the other items. And um, some, uh, a number of these items all peak at around the same height, and that's because we put in the constraint uh, to force the slopes to be equal. Right. So this, the slope is reflected by the height of these peaks. And that item one had a very um, large slope, so that's why we're seeing that. Yeah in this particular plot. Again, a very useful plot for determining uh, how well you've covered the range of traits in the set of items that you plan to use to measure people. So it's really useful. Um, this particular plot uh, is, um, you have to look in a particular direction. So it's, if, you have two, if you have two dimensions, you have to pick which dimension to look at. So that, that's what this code is doing up here. Um, or I guess you could do a two-dimensional plot too, if you uh, if you wanted to see the the uh, two-dimensional surface of the information. All right, and then this is just the standard OpenMX output that's given for mm, any kind of. Uh, model optimization. So we have all the parameters. Um, and let's see, which one had... Um, let's see, we in the information we saw that one of the slopes was particularly high, but we can figure out which one it was. It's probably either um, 1 or 12, something like right? So... Um, let's see, it wouldn't be, it couldn't be 12, it would have to be, uh, it's probably 1 then. 1.82. Trait, it would, it would be one of these trait uh, parameters. Look, that looks like, number 1 looks like the, mm -hmm. the largest trait one. So, and then you got your standard errors. Um, AIC, BIC. The um, uh, these other fit statistics are are not available here because we we didn't select uh, we didn't ask for them. So to get these, you'd have to. Well, I'll, I'll show it in. A, I'll show it later. There's another box you have to select to to get those fit statistics. That's for comparative fit index and Tucker-Lewis index. Yeah. Oh, okay. And RMSEA. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, no, I'm a CA. Okay, great. Um, so that's that's a bit. That's about it, I think. Good. First model. All right. So that looks. Um, that's all. Then we'll we'll be back for the uh, poly poly polygamous 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 <laughs> yeah polygamous <laughs> model. So one of those. Okay. Great.